Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more extra history. This time though, the England South Sea Bubble, the sharp mind of John Blunt. Extra history number one. Uh, I thought, you know what, I was looking for what series should we start after the Northern War? And I was going through, looking at it, and then I remembered, oh wait, who recently watched a video that talked briefly about the South Sea Bubble? So I was like, hey, fuck it, let's go with the South Sea Bubble series. So that's what we're watching. Nice. Uh, before we dive in, though, make sure you go check out the links below in the description box or in my pinned comment, uh, if I remember to leave a pinned comment, uh, and join the Discord. Love to have you. Now, let's go ahead and learn about the South Sea Bubble, because Blue from Overly Sarcastic Productions did it in a very rushed manner, because it was a short video. So, let's begin. Do, do, do. Welcome to the fourth installment of Extra History. This time it's going to be a daring tale of high seas, adventure, and romance. Nah, I'm just kidding. This is going to be all about finance and economics. Money! First off, I just want to say, I think it's amazing that we get to do this episode. Each month, the Patreon subscribers vote on what the next topic is going to be, and last month we just sort of threw in the South Seas Company topic on a lark. It's important, and it's relevant, but we figured there's no way that it would win out against things like the life of Caesar or the Spanish Inquisition. But yeah. delightfully, we were wrong. And that's one of the things that I Nobody ever expects the South Sea Bubble. Love about doing this series. Everything from the YouTube comments to the episode suggestions and the votes from the Patreon supporters reflect not the nihilistic internet that people always talk about, but rather a genuine curiosity and a love of history. I desperately want to cover the campaigns of Caesar and dig into the truth about the Spanish Inquisition too, of course, but I think it's pretty awesome that we have an audience that's also interested in something as obscure and esoteric as the South Seas Bubble. So, what is the South Seas Bubble? It is perhaps some of the wildest financial chicanery of the 18th century. And why are we covering it? Well, because it has a lot of parallels with some of the events of the last few years. It gloriously highlights the importance and value of financial institutions, while also serving as a warning about the incredible danger of invented wealth. But before we can talk about the South Seas Bubble, we have to talk about the South Seas Company. And before we can talk about the South Seas Company, we have to talk about Great Britain in the early 1700s. First off, there okay. was no Great Britain in the very early 1700s, because until the act of- Un Yep, yep, it, I was about to say it, and then this popped up and I was like, oh, I don't need to say it. Union in 1707, England and Scotland were two different countries. But since that's right in the middle of the story that we're about to tell, I'm just going to refer to England as Great Britain throughout, if that's okay. And the first thing to know Fair. about our Great Britain is the fact that in the late 17th and early 18th century, it pretty much could not get enough of being at war. Not yeah. only did the English go through a major civil war in the 17th century, which I am sure we're going to cover someday, but then they just continued to fight pretty much everybody in Europe for the next 100 years. So yeah. with that in mind, I'm just going to start us off in 1710 with a guy named Robert Harley. August of 1710 looks like it's going to be a great month for Mr. Harley. Fantastic. Through a bunch of political wrangling, he's just gotten himself appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer, a position that's basically the same as the Secretary of the Treasury in the U.S. Nice. He's been out of power for a while, but by gum, he's gotten himself back in it now. He's thinking everything is going to be great. Then he looks at Britain's balance sheet. In one column is the 5,000 pounds still remaining in the government treasury, and in the other column is a hastily scrawled note saying... Somewhere roughly, probably around 9 million pounds in big red ink. To give you an idea of just how big this debt is, the current, yes, current Chancellor of the Exchequer announced that a payment toward this consolidated debt will be made on February 1st of 2015. That red ink is still being paid down today, 300 what? years later. So with that in mind, you can pretty much imagine the freakout that Harley had when he realized just how impossible his job was. His first task was just to keep the government afloat through the end of the year. Unfortunately, there were a few hurdles between him and doing that. First, there was the problem of government accounting. At the time, Britain Ugh, had no accounting. unified budget, so while everybody knew that they were in debt, until Harley did a thorough investigation, no one quite knew exactly how in debt they were. Uh. This meant that no real preparation had been done, and since every government department had its own budget and carried its own debts, even after doing a deep dive on the books, even Harley could only give a ballpark estimate of how much debt they really had to tackle. Second problem, the House of Commons was a deeply partisan two-party body. For the last few years, the Parliament had been controlled by the Liberal Whigs, with the Conservative Tory minority routinely blocking any legislation from the opposite side of the House. Well, now the Tories had come into power, and you better believe the Whig minority was going to do the same thing to them. 
Of course, in response, the Tories were busy calling for the impeachment of members of the previous Whig government, and <laughs> all of this just made raising taxes a near impossibility. With taxation as a revenue stream cut off, Harley turned to the next viable option to keep the government running, War? the Bank of England. The Bank of England, though, was created by the Whigs, and was a Whig-controlled institution. In fact, this is the beginning of the age of central banking. The Bank of England was really the first institution of its kind, a bank specifically designed to lend money to the government and make sure the government remained solvent. But since most of the board members of the Bank of England were Whigs, and Harley was a Tory, the bank was none too quick to help the government out. This left only foreign creditors as a possible source of revenue for the government, but given how deeply in debt the government already was, and how many people it was still fighting, outside credit wasn't really available. So, with no other options left to him, Harley turned to less orthodox sources. Namely, John Blunt of the Hollow Sword Blade Company. What a Despite name! Blunt being an odd name for one of the fellows in charge of a company which held the monopoly on making fine swords, our Mr. Blunt possessed a sharp financial mind and very few, if any, scruples. He saw the government's critical financial state not as some great national crisis, but rather an opportunity to make money. Lots and lots of money. Fair. But he couldn't just sell the government rapiers. No. Blunt needed cold, hard cash. So he dreamed money. up a scheme so convoluted it's kind of hard to even describe, but I'm going to give it my best shot. The real estate market in Ireland was currently up for grabs, as yeah. the British government had just confiscated large amounts of Catholic land. Blunt wanted the Hollow Sword Blade Company to buy as much as it could, as cheaply as possible. Unfortunately, the Hollow Sword Blade Company didn't quite have the capital to do that, so they needed to raise some money in a hurry. Normally, you would do this just by selling stock in the company, but Blunt had a much more intricate plan. He offered to trade stock in the Hollow Sword Blade Company for army debentures at under market value to anyone who was willing to make the swap. Now, army debentures were a form of government debt. Basically, they were a promissory note that the army issued when it couldn't afford to, you know, actually pay for things. The problem was, you can't exactly repossess the army's car, so those promissory notes aren't actually backed by anything, making them very hard for people to collect on, which in turn made them nearly worthless. Okay, so at this point, you're probably confused. Uh -huh. How is the Hollow Sword Blade Company gonna make money by swapping shares in their company at under-market value for army debt that most people are just looking to get rid of anyway? Well, Blunt realized that an offer this good was gonna entice a lot of people into taking him up on it, thereby massively inflating the demand for, and thus the price of, army debentures. So oh. he very quietly went out ahead of time and had the company quietly buy up as many army debentures as it possibly could before announcing their offer to swap debentures for company shares. Oh. That way, when they announced their offer, the value of all the debentures they picked up would go through the roof. On top of that, because the land he was aiming to buy was government-held, he could trade the government debt for the land directly at whatever value he'd driven the debt to. This tangly web of financial magic ended up getting him not only the £200,000 he needed to buy land in Ireland, but also another £20,000, which he politely loaned to the government at a very low rate. Now that is... that's fucking genius. Like, that's not even... I wouldn't even, I mean, obviously, yeah, the, the bit at the beginning where before announcing he buys army debentures, that is obviously illegal uh, in the modern day. God damn, is it smart. That's fucking smart. Now, what Blunt and the Hollow Sword Blade Company did here is certainly illegal today, and probably was illegal back then, too. In fact, there was even a court ruling against the company, but since they were now busy lending the government money, no action was ever taken against yep. them. After all, when you're busy lending money to the government, who exactly is going to punish you for bending the law? Which is, of course, what got Blunt and Harley together in the first place. Blunt was helping the government find funds, and Harley badly needed funds to be found, so it was high time they take tea. The Bank of England had been running a rather mediocre lottery for the government the last few years, and Harley decided that Blunt was just the man he needed to kick it up a notch. So he got the rights to administer the government lottery turned over to Blunt and his crew. And man, did Blunt do a bang-up job. Nice. In four days, he sold out all of the tickets, pocketing a tidy profit for himself in the process. He then followed it up with an unbelievably exorbitant lottery with tickets that cost thousands of dollars apiece by today's standards. And he sold out all of those, too. The only problem was that part of the way he did this was by making sure that every ticket won something. At minimum, you were guaranteed to get at least 10% of the price of your ticket back in winnings, which hmm. is great for the gambler, but not so great for the government. The key, though, was that the government would pay out the winnings over the next decade rather than right away, bringing a much-needed influx of cash to the exchequer. 
So while, yes, this added still more long-term debt the government owed, it gave Harley the 300,000 pounds he needed to see the government through <laughs> the next few months. But it's going to take way more than just lotteries to solve the larger looming debt crisis. So join us next time for the scheme that Harley and Blunt pulled together to tackle the long-term British debt, a scheme that will be called the South Seas Trading Company. This one seems, this one's going to be fun. Uh, so that was the first part of the England South Sea Bubble, The Sharp Mind of John Blunt, by Extra History, Extra Credits. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.